Please don't be shy. It's okay if you're a few minutes late. Um, with Thomas Brash and Amanda Hope Haley. We're so thrilled that they both traveled um, to come to Vancouver for this exhibition. Um, you're about to hear more about them, but I just want to quickly go over their bios here. Um, so Thomas Brash, the artist in this exhibition, has devoted 30 years to education uh, before embarking on his second career as a photographer. Completely self-taught in his discipline, he's able to showcase uh, his perceptions of beauty, turning the real into the surreal. He's had several shows in Toronto and has been in several group shows internationally, which I'm sure he may share about. With a background in sciences, language, education, and business, he blends his skills that he has learned and applies them to his artistic practice. His style of abstraction is multi-layered, as you can see, providing an underlying statement to the aesthetics. His representational work highlights his discovery from the ancient to the modern during his journeys. And we're really looking forward to hearing from Thomas today about this show. And our other lovely guest, Amanda Hope Haley, is here as of last night, two nights ago? Two nights ago from Chattanooga, Tennessee. And if I didn't men men mention this, Thomas is in from Toronto. Um, so we've got some people who traveled to be here today, which is so exciting. So Amanda holds a Bachelor's of Arts in Religious Studies from Rhodes College and a Master of Theological Studies in Hebrew, Hebrew Scripture and Interpretation from Harvard University. She is a lover of the Bible. It's God, it's words, it's people, and it's history. And she writes podcasts and has authored several books, um, two of which are on the table, so you can take a look at them back there. Um, she writes in podcasts as the red-haired archaeologist, and I love that name, <laughs> bringing readers and listeners on their journeys to understand artifacts and how they contextualize scripture. She contributed to The Voice Bible as a translator, writer, and editor, and has been a content editor and ghostwriter for popular Christian artists, or authors. Amanda and Thomas, her husband, live in Tennessee with their always entertaining basset hound, Copper. And I love that fact. <laughs> her husband is David. My husband's David, but oh, did I say Thomas? ironically, my brother-in-law is Thomas. Oh, so yeah, amazing. My brain is thinking about Thomas right now. <laughs> Every time I mentioned Thomas the last few weeks, my husband would be like, you're going, you're going up there with my brother? What? Oh, it's perfect. Okay. It's perfect. Um, so I'd love to uh, hear a little bit more about this exhibition. Thomas, if you could elaborate quickly. And then um, if you wanted to speak, Amanda, to how this collaboration came about and why you're involved, like, why are you here today? <laughs> okay, well, thank you, actually, for having me here at uh, recent college, the Dallas Shindle Gallery. Um, yes, I have been a lens-based artist for, like, about the last 12 years. I dabbled before then while I was in education. And for the last six years, I've been working on this one series called Out of the Darkness, which are the pieces here you would see to your left if you're here in the audience. Uh, for other people that are following on Instagram, you would have to scroll through my work. There is a sister series called Enlightenment, and th those are most of the pieces that are on the audience's right-hand side. But I'll start first with Out of the Darkness, because I think it has a very important message. Um, I started originally after an event. We were traveling in Barcelona, and when we re and I fell in love with the city and the architecture. Um, when we returned home, four days later, there was the terrorist attack on the Ra uh, the Ramblas, and several of the several of the uh, victims were tourists. And I thought that could have been us. And then my thoughts expanded. And I thought we traveled to a lot of cities and quite possibly can happen to anybody at any time. And so the seed of an idea had begun and I started experimenting with my process. And so what I create are these sort of iridescent orbs that kind of she uh, shine out of this blackness. And they're site specific images, but they're manipulated. So the idea behind this is to create, you know, document an event uh, commemorate uh, that, you know, the victims of that event, and also spread a message about the dangers of, you know, um, terror, well, not so much terror, it, it starts with conspiracy theories, 
then it can evolve then to some sort of radicalized thinking in which we, like those people, would believe that the solution is some sort of senseless violence where innocent people are killed. So this has been the basis of that work and I'm hoping that these images that have very much an aesthetic appeal are images that can sort of promote a healing for individuals as well as you know the greater group because as the series expanded I also expanded into other aspects not just the individual acts of terrorism but domestic terrorism and state terrorism and these are supposed to address also that collective trauma, that scar that's left on that community, that city, that country. So though that's the, the short side of that story, the enlightenment, I, I was also traveling through so many other cities and I thought, I, I have to also somehow make note of these pieces. Um, there was just so much beauty and art and architecture I wanted to capture, but I wanted to do this differently. So the idea with this is there's less of a layering, it's more photorealistic, there are other shapes involved, but still these are pieces on a black background that sort of shine out at you. And the basis behind that series is to celebrate uh, humanity's accomplishments and, and humanity's gifts unto itself. So it was sort of the antidote to the art of, out of the darkness. Could I ask you, what do you find the most exciting about combining these two? And when we were talking originally, Thomas and I were kind of trying to reconcile, how could we um, put these two series together and what that could maybe mean for you all as viewers walking through the gallery, um, encountering pieces that have some disturbing truths, and um, and then also encountering these these enlightenment pieces. Um, so I I wonder if that has sparked anything in you, and and have you seen your work in a new light having these juxtaposed series? Um, they are very loosely. I mean, they are somewhat related in that I really felt I had to do something positive. It was getting to be very depressing, always finding these, these dark elements. And whenever we would travel, the first thing I would do is Google the location and see what has happened there. You know, I would be Googling terrorism, shooting, stabbing. And it, it's very much a, a case of dark tourism, but that is not the goal of all of our travels. And I think the overall message between the two series is there's this element of hope. So out of the darkness is a, a hope for something better, but enlightenment is you know, the fact that it is there right in front of us. We just have to visually see it. So in that case, it, it, it is a sort of travel photography, but it's an abstract travel photography through my eyes, the way I sort of um, visualize these things. So but I would say that is the connection between those two. Lovely. Now Amanda, I'd love to hear how you two got connected and I'm sure everyone in the audience would as well. Well, it was the power of Instagram. Um, I'm actually not sure how you found me to begin with, but one day I opened up and I had this long, lovely message from him express, explaining to me the work that he does and his desire to find an image from Hebron from someone who had actually been there. He didn't want to use a stock photograph or anything like that if he could possibly encounter a human who had actually been there. And the way he described his work really resonated with me, I think because of what I do and because of my travels into Israel. In 2019, that's the last time I went, I went and I dug at a place called Tel Shimron. And after I was finished digging, my husband and my parents came and joined me there. And then I toured them through the country for about two weeks. None of them had ever been before. And I got to not only do research for my next book, go to archeological sites, take photographs, do the things that I needed to do, but I also saw this this amazing place through their new eyes at that point too. And one thing that I realized in going with them was 
the juxtaposition in Israel of the ancient and the modern, and then also the beauty and the horror, all of that exists together in every place that you go, even in Hebron. And so when he was explaining to me everything that he was going to be doing, I really wanted to be a part of it because I, he was specifically asking about Hebron. I, I was shocked by my travels there. 2019 was the first time I had ever been. And I took something called a dual narrative tour. I had the opportunity to visit both the Israeli and the Palestinian side, to go to uh, the tomb of the patriarchs, which was built over the cave of Mahpelah, and just to again, see both sides of it. And so it was something I wanted to potentially collaborate on, but I responded quickly, my enthusiasm, but also said, I'm, a, I'm an author, I'm taking pictures for a, for a book that are gonna be printed in very small format, and I doubt I have what you need, but I sent you, I don't know how many photographs, I just sent them all the raw files. The whole trip, she I sent, sent me the whole oh, it is trip. trip. No, I didn't send you 3,000. No, 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 no. Oh, but, but, but everything from Rome. Yeah. Yes. yeah, and I was like, I don't wanna edit for you, I don't know what you're looking for, but if there's anything here, yes, yes, you can have it. And so he picked a picture of the minbar, and when you go to the Tomb of the Patriarchs on the, on the uh, Muslim side, on the mosque side, there is this beautiful piece of architecture, of furniture. Um, it, it, it's, it's, um, it's where the men go up on Fridays and they give their messages every week. That's, that's the piece that he picked. And um, so, yeah, I, I gave it to him and I then I think taught you a little bit about it. Exactly. Yeah, yes. it was... Well, and if I could ab elaborate and give the big picture on, and how I found Amanda. So I also had this trip through Israel. It was pretty amazing. And naturally, there was the dark tourism element. And I started Googling events. But I had also just recently read this one book as well um, called the, um, the Wrong Kind of Jew by Hen Mazza. And it told more of a complete story. Uh, about Israel and its need to exist. But, um, so that's what inspired the first piece. Uh, he was telling the story of when his grandmother was expelled amongst all the other Jews back in 1941. And, and there was also some deaths then. So this was June 1st and 2nd, 1941. It's called the Farhud. And this is just shortly after the formation of the State of Israel and all of the uh, Middle Eastern, Northern um, African Jews were expelled and basically pushed into the borders of Israel. So for him, there is nowhere else to go. So I had that story and obviously I couldn't get to Baghdad. Uh, that just was not on the itinerary, but I had been in the Israel Museum in Jerusalem and I saw this beautiful dress in a case. It was an Iraqi Jewish wedding dress and I've used fabrics before in my work. So I knew this would work. So it, it comes out to this beautiful lace work and it's the centerpiece there between the three. So those three pieces are the Israel triptych. Uh, naturally, there's the Tel Aviv piece, which is to the left. Um, and that is the fountain at the Ditzengoff uh, Square. And that's when I discovered through my numerous Googlings again, that actually represents two events. There were two different bombings in that square. I mean, you can go anywhere in Israel and there will always have been an event. But I wanted to complete the trilogy with a complete story. So I mean, I wanted to get the, the Palestinian side as well. And again, I had Googled, once again, and I came across the um, Hebron massacre. Little did I know, that, again, there's more than one, but this is the one I was talking about, it's the 1994 one where people who were worshiping in a mosque were gunned down by a uh, radicalized right-wing uh, American Israeli. So how do I get this picture? I had always thought I would be doing this collaboration so naturally. I mean, I couldn't just Google it this time, although that might have worked. I just used the hashtags in Instagram and I started looking for people's pictures of that location. And there were a few people I reached out to, but Amanda was the only one that actually responded. And then when she sent the pictures, you know, with her disclaimer, she didn't think it would work. But the way my technique works, it doesn't matter so much the size of the original image. And a lot of our, our digital uh, phones, our phones take pictures of a reasonable size. 
And the way I create my piece is I take a rectangular image, I flip it front to back several times, I wrap it into a circle, sometimes I'll also flip it onto the inside of the circle, I'll take a copy of that circle, I might manipulate it again a bit, or rotate it, and then I blend it. I might do that a few times. So if you were to look at that image, you would never think that that just came out of, it, it was originally an iPhone, right? Yeah. That image, you know, and it was just a, a, an ordinary, I, I don't think larger than eight and a half by 11, but you can see the incredible details. And if you look at the different uh, exhibition catalogs, you will see the source images and that will give you some context to it. But then that's how I made this tenuous connection with Amanda and then it went from there. And actually I'm gonna have her talk about what she thought on her side and maybe talk a bit about the 1994 event and then what's the other one again, the 19... 1929. Okay, yeah. so I'll pass that on to you now. So you mentioned what happened in 1994. It, it was shortly after the end of the Second Intifada. And at that time in, in Hebron, most of the building was still a mosque. Um, I'll start with 1929, actually, it'll be easier to go forward in history. Prior to 1929, um, this was under, this was after World War II, the British came in and they did, they formed a British mandated Palestine, and they made all sorts of rules there. Well, at that time in Hebron, Jews and Muslims were really living next to each other in, in harmony. Well, in 1929, um, the Grand Mufti in Jerusalem, uh, went and he spoke to everyone and told his listeners that the Jews were uh, they were going into Jerusalem and they were going to try to take over a lot of mosque and he encouraged everyone to come to Jerusalem to come to that area and to stop them doing so this wasn't a hundred percent accurate um, but what happened was uh, the Muslim men came in about 800 of them did and then the British military turned them away and the British military sort of unwittingly played into his hands. The Muslim men then turned around, they went back to their city, specifically to Hebron. Hebron is only 18 miles south of Jerusalem, so it was the closest major city. They went there and for two days, they went literally door to door, taking their Jewish neighbors out and killing them. All of the people that they killed, they lumped up their bodies, they burned all but 10 of the bodies, which is of course particularly offensive to, to the Jewish community. And um, that is considered year one of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. When I was in school, even though I studied this in undergrad, um, I, I studied the Middle East and specifically uh, this area, this conflict, this is something I wasn't even taught. I learned about it when I was there in, in, Palestine, in, in Hebron at the time. And so after that, um, the, basically uh, the, Jews, the Jews were not allowed into the area. The, um, the mosque in Hebron was, it, it was completely a mosque. And then that's, that was the status quo until 1967, when you had the Six Day War. And at that point, the Jews went and they built a small synagogue sort of adjacent to the building. And they would worship there. They were allowed up seven steps. They were allowed to get close, but they still were not allowed to go inside. Well, in 1994, there was the second intifada that ended in 93, 1994, this, uh, this doctor, um, he was an army doctor, he came in and he committed this atrocity. Well, once he murdered 23 people, there were well over 100 who were, who were hurt, then the Muslims who were worshiping there, they turned on him, they killed him, and this kicked off uh, about two days of complete violence in Hebron. The Israeli government came in, they shut everything down, they put everyone under a 24 hour curfew for an entire week. No one could leave their homes, they shut down the religious center, that was it. But when they opened it back up at the end of that week, um, there was basically a line drawn down the center of the building. And for the first time, there was a synagogue there again. So now today, when you go, 60% of the building is a mosque, 40% of it is a synagogue. If you are Israeli, if you are a Jew, you cannot cross into the other side of the building. If you are a Muslim, if you are a Palestinian, if you carry that passport, you cannot cross over into the synagogue side, except on 10 designated high holy days. Um, so that, that's the situation there. Um, and yeah. So you can see Israel carries, uh, it, it's, it's a big situation. <laughs> with very few answers at the moment, and, and I don't want that to overshadow the whole part of this show, 
I have three other pieces that you can't actually see. And, and this is possibly a better note on it. Um, first one being Oslo, which is to the left here. The center one is Montreal. And the one on the far right is Paris. And I put these three together as a triptych in that each one of these countries, like something happened here, a traumatic event, collective uh, trauma, but each one of these countries is doing something on the level of national recognition as well as education. So when we were in Oslo last year, I had the opportunity to drop into this museum. I didn't even know it existed. I thought there would just be a, a memorial. And it was more than a museum. It explained everything, but I found it was also very child-friendly. And people were bringing in even their babies. And their purpose was to make this a non-triggering environment in which children were invited. And it was also an education center. They want to teach the dangers of conspiracy theories and radicalization. And, and it's a big thing, 77 people died that day. And of course, you know, when that was going on, a lot of people thought it was foreign terrorism. But no, it was another Norwegian that had been radicalized and had just gone off the deep end. Thinking once again, senseless violence is a solution. The middle piece, Montreal, um, many people might remember, might not, back in 1989, the Montreal massacre in which 14 women were killed for being women. The gunman there felt that these women were taking his place in the engineering school. He had been declined admission, and so he went into a classroom, he separated the men from the women, and then he started to systematically shoot the women. Montreal, the Ecole Polytechnique, they are still very strong and vocal on Twitter with, um, you know, gun control, it's police souvient. Um, there is also the White Ribbon Campaign, which I think is recognized nationally. They also have different um, scholarships as well. So th there's a very strong presence, more so in Montreal, but it is something, it, you know, we have had other shootings in Canada, but that one was just very emblematic. And that becomes the marking point of all of our debates about gun control here. The far right one, Paris, I realized um, it, it hasn't happened yet, but in two years' time, they are going to have a special museum dedicated to the effects of terrorism, not only for Paris, but they also have the attack in Nice, and there are several others. So this is also going to be a commemorative educational piece. So this is what I'm hoping my work can do. There, there is the one level of just pure aesthetics that's meditative, reminiscent of mandalas, which are, you know, places where people, you know, you would look at a mandala, you meditate, you might heal internally. It's also commemorative, but it's also a way of opening up a discussion without using triggering images. We've all seen the images of violence. We either flip through them quickly or we ignore them. We've seen too many, we've become inundated. This is my attempt, first of all, to not trigger anybody, but also to open up that discussion. They are site-specific scenes, you know, so for instance, the Montreal piece is a sculpture that's right in front of the, like right inside the Poly Polytechnique. Um, the Oslo is the cathedral, which is, um, I mean, that wasn't the location, but that it, they had just had a commemorative ceremony. They have a memorial garden outside of Iron Roses. It was still very moving. We, we had just missed that ceremony by five days. So, and, and my piece in Paris, that is actually the ceiling of Sacre Coeur. And even though the series is meant to be secular and non-political, I do find that often places of worship command a certain amount of respect and awe. And often, you, you don't have to be religious. You just, if you go into a church or a place of worship, you just naturally meditate, you become introspective. And I think that's completely true. Um, so, you know, I may not be very religious, but I certainly could respect the magnificence of this building and, and just finding that peace and tranquility there. So 
It is important. Um, just further to that, I have another book recommendation. Oh, I left it over there by that. Um, I will be reading it shortly. It is Tam uh, Tamara Cherry's book, the, the Trauma Beat. And it's also how do we report the news without causing more pain to the different victims and, and perpetuating this cycle of collective trauma. So this is what I'm trying to do with that series, basically. I would love to know why it was important for you, because obviously we were connected uh, through someone in the audience, Michelle Huseman, and we're very thankful for that connection. Um, but why the Del Chanel Gallery and Regent College? Why is it important for you to have um, this exhibition that carries such weight with it um, in this space at a theological school? And I know you have a Catholic background, so I don't know if you want to uh, address that at all or, um, yeah. Sure, certainly. Um, well, there were several reasons for it, and some of the reasons came after the decision was made, actually. I, I'm not a practicing Catholic, but I think we can all agree that in most religions, uh, the basic precepts are, you know, love, peace, respect for your fellow, you know, man or woman. Um, and I mean, I, I certainly respect that, and, it, and it's something that resonates with me and even though this series again as i say is very um, secular there is a certain amount of spiritual vibe to it so when this came up with regent college and the dalshino gallery i thought it's a perfect venue plus it was an opportunity to show outside of toronto so i felt like i was getting my message further out there and then when I actually saw and learned more about the gallery space, there's a lot of light in here. You, you may not notice there's a lot of backlighting in our, our video here, but there's incredible light. And I know it sounds like a pun, a horrible pun, but it literally illuminates the work. You can really see it pop. It just seems so appropriate. So I don't actually even mind that the pieces get direct sunlight. It is archival ink. Um, they will be fine for the month period, the period of the month. The other thing I did do, which was sort of a last minute thing, I thought, well, if there's that much light, there would be a lot of glare. So I have elected to remove all the glazing from the images. There's no glass or plexi. You are looking at the bare print. So that way, there's nothing between you and the print, and you can see all those details. I know it's taking a risk of actually exposing art, but I was willing to take that risk. I think it's important for um, people in general just to be able to access and experience art because what else is there in life? You know, when you're just having a, a bad day, don't we all want to look at a nice picture? Yes, I would say we do. <laughs> so Amanda, I'd love to hear a bit more about uh, your current research. I know we, we touched lightly on the fact that you do archaeological digs and you just had this one in 2019 in Israel. Um, but your most recent book, it's The Red-Haired Archaeologist Digs. Is that what it's titled? Yes. Okay. Digs Israel. Yeah, Digs Israel. Amazing. <laughs> so I would love to know, what are you working on currently? Uh, we obviously have some masters in theological studies students that I, I see in the audience, and I'm sure they're they're also curious. Like, what is, what is your um, current lens? Well, that was that that is intended to be the first in the series, and so uh, right now I'm uh, actually working with my agent, and we are crafting what I think the next four books are going to look like. I think the next one is going to be Digs Egypt. That's where um, that's where I've been spending a lot of my time lately is di diving back into that. It's been many years since I have studied any Egyptology, but I want to look at the intersection of Egyptian history and Israelite history, and it con consider consider those combinations. What what we can learn from the records that have been left behind by Israel, by Egypt, what actually comes out of the ground, take a look at the interesting places like Akhenaten and consider you know, when maybe Exodus have happened, all of those big questions that I think are, that are popular, they're things that a lot of people of the book really spend a lot of time considering. And you know, let's look at all the options of when those things may have happened. So um, that's, that's where my brain is these days. <laughs> and maybe she can take me with her and I can take more pictures. <laughs> yes, I'm gonna have to go. That, that'll be the next thing is actually booking the trip and getting over there. So. <laughs> or this whole idea of collaborations, you know, now that I've formed this uh, relationship and, I, and I'm thinking of another one, 
with somebody down in Argentina. I, I can't possibly go to every place where there might be something. And so this is a way of still keeping the art authentic. And it's also, it, it crosses uh, different genres. So like, it's value added for my stuff in that, you know, it's, it's validated by Amanda's work, and, and I'm hoping that the same is in the reverse, you know, it, it gives a little more context and visual appeal to what her work would be about. It absolutely does. Honestly, after interacting with you more and getting to know you, I, I don't think about photography as being my primary. I'm, I'm an author first, but because of the nature of what I do when I'm talking about artifacts, if an archaeologist just stands up there and drones on and on and on about history, that's it, it, it loses. It gets the meaning gets lost. You need that visual, and the images are so important. So many of us are visual learners, and even when I'm talking about the Bible, one thing that I like to do when I'm teaching people is to show them a picture of some sort of archaeological artifact that may not look the way that they expect it to, and it causes people to think differently and maybe think a little bit deeper about scripture. For me, but photography, I. I, I am not a talented photographer, but it is it is so important. It's something I need to learn more about. Well, and, and, it, and it worked out extremely well in this case, you know, because I, I can't tell you how happy I was that I had that image and that I could work with it. It was just, you know, I did reach out to three or four other people, and it, it's just the silence, you know, it was just the silence. And then when I got this message from him, plus then you have to feel each other out to make sure, first of all, that it works and the other person is not you know, a little odd or something, or has some sort of hidden agenda, right? So it is, those things are important, right? You know, we each have our reputation, our professional reputation to maintain. So, you know, that was great. So when Amanda said, well, what if I come up to the opening? I thought, okay. And then this developed with the talk and, and we could incorporate this all. I thought this was excellent. It was very cross-disciplinary. It was entertaining. We could do something with this. So it, 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 it worked out extremely well for both of us. And she made that long journey from Tennessee all the way up here. And then she's going back shortly tomorrow. We're all leaving actually tomorrow. But I really appreciate it. I'd like to thank you from the bottom of my heart that you've thank come. Thank you for having me. Oh, well, <laughs> you're welcome. And before we wrap up here, I just want to open it up to uh, anyone who has any questions for Thomas or Amanda. Obviously, they both have um, a wealth of knowledge and are very well traveled. Um, so I'd love to know if any of you have a question or a comment or are particularly curious about certain things that um, you see in any of the art here. Any questions about the locations? why these locations? I mean, most of these locations were just completely by chance. You know, they were places that we went to. A few of my trips are actually planned, uh, but not too many. Montreal was planned, obviously, but it's close to Toronto. Yeah, Julie. Yeah, so which Santiago is the picture about Santiago? Oh, the event of Santiago? Santiago, Chile. Yes. So that actually, that piece, you can't see it, but it's, it's, it looks like a magnificent blue marble. And uh, we were going anyways to Santiago, Chile, and of course I was doing the ruling, the dark tourism, and, and actually, other than another dictatorship that saw a lot of victims from that, and I, I still have yet to create that piece, I came across this one interesting story and it was a, a little bit, it was a little bit morbid as well. And this is the first time I've ever done a piece about the death of a single person. Uh, this was a very violent homophobic attack against this young man. Um, I, don't, I won't go into the details because it was very triggering. And he, he did not die immediately. There was a hospital close by and then he died a few days later. But it left the nation outraged, completely outraged, and the president at the time, I can't remember exactly the, the president's name, then suddenly brought in all of these human rights laws that protected several different types of citizens, but certainly for the LGBT community, but as well for others as well, and they were just, put, there was some hesitancy to bring them in, there was some, you know, stalling, 
by certain organizations as well. You know, it's, you know, the church likes to be cautious sometimes, but at that point, it just became required, you know, and it was a, a social conscious act from this uh, president to do it. And that, that image is actually constructed, the source image of that are the windows of the courthouse where the, the three, no, four, there were four assailants. They were tried and uh, convicted. And it's a magnificent courthouse. I didn't know what part of the building I would take for the picture. There was, there was a lot of glass, there was some wood, there was some interesting architecture. But in the end, when I come home and I sort through all of my pictures, so on any given trip, it's, if it's a two week trip, I easily have 5,000 pictures. I, I just settled on that one. I know there's certain things I can do with certain types of images. Uh, originally when I started the series, it was more touch and go. But I knew that glass and reflections, blues work well. I put a little bit of a curve into it. And when it happened, it was just like, that's it. You know, the process can sometimes take as little as three hours, or it can take three to six hours, or it can take three to six hours over several days. This was definitely something that happened in three hours. And it, and it just, when I see it on the screen, I go, okay, I know that, how that that's the one. Yeah, Sarah. Um, I have a question. It's a small question, but um, I just noticed on the, the first page of the titles of your works, um, there's several pieces that are called prayer in different languages. Like, I can recognize the German. Oh, piece okay. Language, yes. But, um, yes. Yeah, so I, I was wondering, like, with the same title in different languages, Okay, so that was a very interesting, so that was part of the Israel trip, and that was not nothing to do with Out of the Darkness, and we were walking down the Mount of Olives, and certain things that I wanted to see were closed, or whatever, and then we stumbled upon this church at the base of um, the Mount of Olives, the Church of All Nations, which I found out later. It was just completely coincidental. And the interior was uh, magnificent. The ceiling is all of these rich blues, and there's a lot of gold and white eyes. And I said, oh, I know I can make something out of this. It's right next to the Garden of Gethsemane. So I said, there's got to be some sort of historical significance. I, I am really not, not well informed. I mean, Amanda can explain everything about that church later. So it was an experimentation process this time, and, and I really liked the idea behind the story of that church, but I decided to use the same source image for all three interpretations. So if you were to look in that, uh, one of the programs, it's the same pillar that flutes up, but I created three very different pieces, but I decided to give it the name of prayer, and because I study languages as well, I put in, you know, for instance, the first piece that I really was special to me, I put in the German word for prayer, debate. And I'm studying Spanish, so naturally, oracion, right? And I think French, well, I know French, prière, right? So it, it, it all worked out. And, and what I like about this church is that it is called the Church of All Nations because several nations have paid for the, the construction, I guess, the maintenance of this church. And so the idea of using the different languages was also representative of the different nations that contributed to it, right? So, and, and of course, many of the countries of Latin America and Spain are, are part of that uh, consortium. I think France, Canada has also contributed to it. The United States has also contributed to it. And um, surprisingly enough, uh, people don't really think of Germany being a religious country. But I can tell you, actually, especially in the South, it is extremely Catholic. And when we were in Israel, there were tons of Germans all over the place. They were just like so taken with this, you know, the, the trip to the Holy Land. So, you know, it, it seemed like a small question. Sorry, I went on with it. But it, it has each one of these, you know, pieces has a different story attached to it. And uh, no two are alike. But that is the first time I actually ever used the same source image. So it, it was a, a bit of an experiment in the way it turned out. I just love them as a triptych. So the, the whole show is kind of based on diptychs, triptychs, and polyptychs, which are images of four. And I, I think it really works. You know, it tells a more complete story that way. You're welcome.
Well, if there aren't any more questions from the audience, Thomas and Amanda are gonna hang out for a little bit if you wanna just talk to them uh, individually. But I do encourage you to check out uh, the programs that are in uh, the leaflet books because they contain the source images for each of the pieces. So if you'd like to see um, before and afters, um, we'd encourage you to take a peek at those. I've also left copies of Amanda's uh, most recent books. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, at the table if you want to take a look at those as well. In addition, just a quick plug, the exhibition uh, books are actually available for purchase. So for $40, you can take this collection home with you. And um, if you want to make a purchase, you can just let me or Thomas know. So yes, no, and I, I, I'm not giving a plug to it, but I am giving a plug to it. Um, they're 12 by 12 inches. They're 100 pound paper. It's glossy paper. They have the full page of the resulting image. But plus, the, I've included the source image, some other context images, and a little bit of the story behind each piece in a way that is, again, you know, if it's out of the darkness, it's not triggering. And it, it does show, like, it, all, of, all of the pieces that are in the show are in that book. I do believe, there's also a little bit of text, I do believe it's 48 pages. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. And let's give Amanda and Thomas a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you for attending. Oh, little waves.